drop in a, a basket later during our service so that we can get in contact with you, let you know a little bit about our church, and on the back of every Connect card, there is a place to write a prayer request, and that is open for everybody. Uh, we would love for you guys to fill out ways that we can be praying for you as a church family, and then, of course, drop that in the basket later during our service. Uh, women's Retreat uh, is coming up on April 12th and 13th. So if you are not signed up for that, there is still time, uh, and uh, there is a sign up on, in the back at the Connect Center uh, to carpool uh, for that, because I believe that is Spring Hill somewhere around there. Uh, so uh, if you would like to carpool, the, the sign up is in the back at the Connect Center. Uh, we also are starting a brand new series starting next week. Uh, the title of that is Eight Questions that Jesus asked. And so we're going to spend eight weeks going through different questions that Jesus uh, just put out there. And, and so what that means for us. Um, and, and so we're looking forward to that. But we are going to go ahead and get started. And so if you will join me in prayer, we will get our service started this morning. Uh, so Lord, we uh, thank you uh, and appreciate uh, the blessing uh, that you have given us this morning, this Resurrection uh, Sunday. And so, Father, we pray that this would all glorify you. Uh, Holy Spirit, we invite you to overwhelm us this morning uh, so that we may glorify the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen.
prayer reading out of Matthew 28, verses 5 through 16. And the word of the Lord says, The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Hallelujah. Yeah. 
pretty powerful message. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. He is risen. He is, he is risen indeed. And we are glad that you're here this morning celebrating with us. Uh, Friday night, we had a good Friday service in here. And honestly, like even reflecting back on it, it at least for me personally, is probably my favorite uh, Good Friday slash cantata service we've ever done. Mm -hmm. It was powerful. And I, I told the team just leave the stage set up. It was a powerful testimony to what Christ has done. And this morning we're going to be diving deeper into that. This morning I've called uh, the sermon Vindicated. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to Luke 24. We're going to be getting there in a second. Uh, um, but it, it is amazing. It's, it's hard to believe that Easter is here. A fourth of the year is already done with, in case you didn't know. Uh, after this week, if you're new or even just in regular attendance, uh, the next eight weeks, uh, we're going to be doing a series leading it up to December for the next eight weeks, uh, starting next week, uh, called Eight Questions Jesus Asked. Not answered, asked. Uh, in the Gospels, Jesus asked actually quite a few questions. We're going to look at eight of them and why he asked them. And that series is going to be starting next week. Uh, but this week it is Easter. And it is an amazing day to celebrate. We had a great sunrise service this morning. Uh, we started at 7, about 7.05, 7.10, whatever it was. The sun just came up right in front of us as we were uh, enjoying the service this morning. I think there was a little bit over 50 people there this morning, and it was a, a great time. And so, uh, man, God is good, isn't he? Amen. I, it's been such a wonderful season of life. And, uh, and knowing what God is doing in each one of our lives. And, and the great thing about it is when you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you know you have a, an eternal trust in your heart. And so this morning as we get started, let's go ahead and pray and ask God to, to guide the rest of our service. Lord, we love you, Father. We thank you. Uh, God, we just pray for the service. That your hand would be upon it, Lord. That it would be a blessing to you and your ears, God. That it would be a sweet aroma, Lord. That we get to worship you through song, through prayer, uh, through reading your word, through your Holy Spirit working in this moment right now here, this, um, uh, here today, Lord. And so, God, we are, we are blessed beyond what we deserve. But, Jesus, you gave it anyways. And that's why we are here celebrating this morning. In your name, amen. Uh, years ago, um, I, I was in... Uh, Oregon with my brother Mark, one of my older brothers on the end of six. He's the second oldest. He was here about a month, month and a half ago with his family. And uh, before I was married, before I met my wife Christy, uh, my brother Mark and I had gone uh, rock climbing, mountain climbing. We've done a lot of different things together over the years. Uh, he and I are very much alike in many different ways. We love the outdoors. And there was one time that we were in uh, Oregon, uh, almost in Washington, and we were uh, hiking into this mountain called the Tooth. And we were going to climb it. Uh, ropes, belay, harness, everything that you think of climbing that you see on TV or the movies. That's what we did. And we're climbing this thing. It's multiple pitches, meaning the length of the rope. You climb, then you click, gather rope, then climb again. And uh, we're climbing up it. And at its hardest, if you know anything about rock climbing, at its hardest, I think it was only like a 5.7 or 5.8. It goes up to 5.16. If you're class 4, you're just scrambling. So it goes up from there. And uh, we're climbing, and we're on like our second pitch. And it's pretty steep. And as you're looking out over the side of this mountain, you can see the coast. I mean, you're on the west coast. And when you get to the top, it's even a pretty view. And I'm climbing up. And my brother's climbing next to us. There's about four or five of us that are climbing that day. And all of a sudden, as we're climbing, a husband and wife come free soloing climbing next to us. That means they're not, they're not hooked up to anything. They're just climbing this wall next to us. Now, if anybody's, have anybody seen the movie, the documentary Free Solo in here? Now, that is what they're doing, not as difficult as what he did, but then we're roped in. I'm like, I, I, I'm a fairly experienced climber, and so my brother's even way more experienced than me, and my brother even goes, when they passed me, I was shaking watching them. Because it, it's, it's, you can't believe they're doing it, let alone want to do it that way. But you're also thinking, if they fall, I'm the one that has to witness it. I'm the one that's going to have to rebel down and go help them. And as soon as they get to the second pitch, if they fall, they're dead. And they go climbing up right by us like it's nothing. Like, I'm going slow and steady. And they go right up by us. And, like, I even felt nerves in myself. Of how is, like, why would you do that? Like, I love adventure. I'm not afraid of heights. But if you don't put equipment on me, I might become afraid of heights. Yeah. Like, I tell people all the time, if I'm secure, like, I went repelling a lot. I'm like, you know, when you know how much a harness and ropes and all that stuff can hold, I'm, I'm, the, height, the fear of heights goes away because I know that I'm safe. But the moment you take it away, be 
begin to freak out a little bit. So I'm watching, and they go past me. There's another two pitches. We're talking, literally, we're talking probably 500 feet here. They go climbing up. And I stopped, and I just watched them. And I was like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen anybody do <laughs> in person. And we go climbing, we get to the top. And when we get to the top, we sit there, and the couple's already gone. Because I, like, I wanted to talk to them, but they hiked off the backside. And it's like, I, I wanted to talk to them how long they've been doing that and how long they expect to stay married. And, uh, and so I get to the top, and so you're on the West Coast, and you're close to Washington as well, too. And uh, from the top, you can see Mount St. Helens. You can see uh, Mount Rainier. These are some famous mountains up there in the Northwest. And you can see the coast. And you can see Seattle. And I'm seeing all these views, and I'm thinking to myself, God, this is one of the most glorious views I've ever seen in my life. It was painstaking to get up here. At first, I didn't really want to do it. My brother's like, let's do it. We had already previously, earlier that week, climbed Mount St. Helens. And we had gone white water raft. My brother was an outdoor adventure guide, so he takes me on all those random adventures. And so we had done some of those things already. And I was sitting at the top, and I didn't want to do it, but I was sitting and staring at this beautiful view and just seeing God's glory. It just blew me away of just saying, God, why have we turned our back on you? I mean, the whole point of Jesus coming was because we couldn't do it ourselves. And the whole point of Jesus having to come is because we walked away from God. God didn't walk away from us. You read the beginning of Scripture in Genesis. God spent time with Adam and Eve in the garden. God gave them the most blessed, blessed place that they could live. And we, because of sin, walked away from Him. And as I'm staring at this view, I think to myself, God, why would we do that? And I felt one thing coming back to me over and over again. And it was very simple. Because of pride. We want to be our own God. We don't want someone to tell us that we have to obey someone or something else. It comes down to a lot of pride in us, and it comes down to sinfulness. That's the, that's the root of it is sin. And so why we celebrate something like a picture of this, that Jesus has risen from the dead, is because he had to come because we couldn't do it ourselves. You see, if we could save ourselves, then what was the point of Jesus coming? It's easy enough to reverse the question and ask that question in that way. And so Jesus came, born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, got falsely accused, died on a cross for our sins, predicted it would happen, completed over probably three to four hundred plus prophecies from the Old Testament, rose three days later and showed himself vindicated from what the world had said he was. And so this morning, we're going to read a lot from Scripture. I hope you like the Bible. And so actually, before we get to Luke 24, we're going to read Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12. This is one of the most powerful passages in all of the Bible. If you don't know it, learn it. It is an amazing testimony of what Jesus did before Jesus was even born. This passage, in light of knowing what Jesus has done, this passage was written close to 700 years before he was born. It is, I would say, eerie, if you don't know Christ as Savior, you know there is God. It is eerie how much this resembles Jesus because it's a prophecy of Jesus. See, the person who doesn't know Christ would say, man, this is eerie. This is too close. This is too freaky. The person who knows Christ said, no, this was prophesied. This is God. <laughs> and so it says, see, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. The Bible tells us that Jesus was beaten so bad, you couldn't even tell he was a man anymore. This was 700 years before he was even born. This was not, if he was a mere human, this could not be controlled by him. And so it says in verse 15, so he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. 
Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment, the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgressions of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to do something. To suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and will be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities before I will give him a portion among the great. And he will divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. It's a powerful passage. This is written roughly six, seven hundred years before Jesus lived. Most theologians believe just in this passage alone that there's 28 to 30 prophecies in this passage alone. All dealing with what we're talking about today. Stuff that Jesus, if he was a, just a mere man, couldn't have done on his own. Stuff from the Old Testament that talks about where he would be born, when he would be born, to who he would be born, how he would be born, all coming to light that if he was just mere man, that he could not control. And so people often ask me, where does your faith come from? And I tell them, my faith is not a blind faith. My faith is built on the fact of what the Word has shown, of what <clears throat> eyewitnesses accounted, and what Jesus really did. This is stuff that you can look at and say it's coincidence, but you, you, you can't sit here and say all of this is coincidence after coincidence after coincidence. That just doesn't happen in life. It might happen in movies, but it doesn't happen in life. And so this morning we're going to look at the resurrection in a way that helps us see the vindication of Christ. That he was rejected like we talked about last week, but vindicated this week when he comes back from the dead to show himself once and for all to be the Messiah. And so if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Luke 24, 1 through 9. We're going to begin reading there this morning. On the first day of the week, very, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Now here, we're going to walk through this morning eight vindications that Jesus gave because of showing that he defeated the grave, defeated that he was not who the world said he was, but he was who he said he was. The first one this morning shows us that number one is even the angel told of his glory. We see it here in the passage where the angels show up to Mary Mary. And in Matthew 4, 11 it says, Then the devil left him and the angels <clears throat> came to him and attended him. Even after Jesus went into the desert, when the angels come, it is to declare something. And what they are declaring is Jesus and his glory. And so the vindication of number one that we see of Jesus raising from the dead is the angels told of his glory. This was vindication that Jesus was the Messiah, and the angels were declaring it. 
The second half of verse 6 says, Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Now it's interesting before I get to the number two here, is even thinking about if you're Mary in that moment, and you have angels before you saying, Remember he has risen. I think I would probably be doing what she did. I'd probably be getting on my hands and knees and bowing, realizing this is an, a moment that I do not want to forget. This is a moment that will stand for the history of eternity for mankind to know and to marvel at of what Christ has done. And so it tells us in that next verse, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified on the third day, be raised in the vindication number, number two. Jesus predicted his own death and resurrection. You see, it'd be one thing to say I'm going to predict my death and do things bad enough and cause people hate enough hate to want to kill me. But it would be another thing if I actually raised from the dead and showed myself to be true. Not a mere man or woman can do something like that. It was only God that could do that. Only God could predict the future with such accuracy. When you look at the Old Testament and the New Testament, you see Jesus fulfilling the prophecies that only could come from God. And that could only be fulfilled <laughs> through God. Either Jesus was who he said he was, or he was a lunatic. He couldn't be both. If I was to stand up here before you today and say, hey, I'm going to die tomorrow, but I'll be up on Thursday. <laughs> I'm not sure. We laugh because we know it's unreasonable. We know that that's unreasonable because in our human experience, it tells us that can't be done. <clears throat> and here's the thing, you're right. In our human experience, it can't be done. The scripture makes it very clear that Jesus was fully man, but also fully God. And his godly experience, it could be done. Because he is the one that has power over life and death. When Jesus raised from the grave, he had the power to raise from the grave that no one else in all eternity will have. It is him and him alone. And so when we talk about as Christians, let's put our trust in the Lord. Why? It's because God has power over death. God has power over life. God has power over this world. And guess what? God has power over sin because he's vanquished sin through Jesus Christ. And so it is only him that can, that can do this. And so when Jesus raises from the dead, the angels tell of it, but Jesus predicted that it would happen. In verse 8, it says, Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and all and to all the others. Vindication, reason number three is women found the empty tomb and the grave. Now here's an interesting, interesting thing. It was women that gave the report. Why? It was when women were ineligible to be legal witnesses in the first century. The gospel stories were mocked by second century critic Celsus for their portrayal of the witnesses calling the women hysterical females. Sorry, ladies. Uh, it wasn't that wrote that. Why? I was saying that this morning. If the Bible is a lie, and back then, if you wanted people to believe, in the first century, you would not have two women being the first one to find him. Their report, their account, would not be formidable in any court or in any household. When they found it, they told the, the truth. It is a reminder that the kingdom of the Messiah turns the world's systems on its head. Jesus radically affirmed the full dignity of women and the vital values of, of their witness in this account. But it also shows its historical accuracy and, and truth to the accounts. If this was a trick or, or a myth, like I said, they would never have written down that two women went to find them. They would have written down two men went to find them. There's a lot of things in the Bible. That's one of the things. I talk about this regularly, but it's true. There's a lot of things in the Bible, most things in the Bible that I love, because the Bible is very blatantly truthful about the good and the bad. You read Old Testament historical documents with the Bible, and it tells all the bad stuff in there. We just got done walking through the life of Joseph. You get to see the worst of people in these stories. It gives you a reminder that everybody that you read about in the Bible is just human like you. 
But they chose to follow God. They chose to do what God had called them to do. And so they followed him to the very end of their lives. In Luke 24, 36 to 49, the next section that we're going to read this morning is this. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I, myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And he gives vindication number four here. Jesus appeared in flesh and let them touch him. And he even says himself, no, I'm not a ghost. Why? You can't get any more real than to let people touch your skin and show them your scars. If it wasn't Jesus or just a hallucination, why would Jesus say, touch me and see? You see, this brings us to another thing about ghosts. I don't believe in ghosts. You can watch the movies and TV shows. I want to make something very clear. Because I'm going to make it very clear because this is what the Bible makes very clear. When you die, you go directly before the Lord. And if your name is written in the book of life, you, you go to heaven. And if it is not, you go to hell. We don't like to talk about that, but that is the honest truth of what the Bible says, whether you like it or not. And we need to know the honest truth. You can take it home and wrestle with it all you want, but we need to preach the truth and let reality sink in of what God has said. TV shows like to make us think, oh, we'll just wander the earth until we've completed some mission that we think we're on. That's a lie. And you know who it is? It's the enemy, the biggest liar of them all, it's Satan. The Bible says he's the biggest deceiver. He's got legions of demons that will try to deceive you. It's not humans walking around. It is Satan and demons. There's a spiritual battle going on around us at all times. And it's for your soul. And God wants your soul. Because he loves you, he longs for you, and he wants a life with you for eternity. That's the truth. And here's the thing. It shouldn't have... Pardon me saying this. But you need to really reflect on if you're offended by me saying there's a God that loves you. That wants you. And wants to be etern eternally with you. If that bothers you, then today's maybe the day that you sit in reflection and really think about your life and the path that you're leading. Because there's a God that loves you, wants a relationship with you, and gave his life for you. I can't think of anything better of a God to be able to do than what he has done for us. That's why we celebrate Easter. And so Jesus appeared in the flesh, for reason number four, appeared in the flesh and said, here, touch. Sometimes you see it far off, you see in the movies, oh, I saw it through a window, I saw it deep. He's like, no, he spent time with them, said, touch me, and let's sit and talk. And so he proved that he was real. In verse 40, it says, when he had this, we had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it, because of the joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence, which brings us to vindication number five. He didn't just say, here, touch me. Then he began eating with them. Last time I checked, ghosts don't eat. And he began eating with them. It wasn't just enough for him to be there and for them to touch him. Then he decides to eat it in front of them as another proof that it was surely him. Verse 44, he said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Which brings us to vindication number six. Jesus reminded them he was fulfilling the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. That only he was the one that could do it, and he did it. He was telling them of all the prophecies he would fulfill. But Jesus also made several prophecies, and this was one of them. In verse 45, he says, Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. 
He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And then bring us to vindication number seven. Jesus taught them. You see, it would have been very easy for them to fake it. It would have been very easy to say, oh, he was there. He was there for a second, and then he was gone. No, Jesus spent 40 days, was seen by over 500 people. He ate with them, let him touch them. He taught them. He reminded them of prophecies. He did all of this to show them once and for all that when I do go, don't forget everything I have done. Let's just stop and think about that for a second. When he does go, even 2,000 years later, don't forget everything that he did to show that it was real. This, uh, this was not one or two people in a split second of like, oh, did I see it, did I not? This was Jesus over 40 days, 500 plus people sat and taught with them, sat and reminded them of prophecy, sat and ate with them, and proved that he was real. Verse 48, he says, you are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And leads us to vindication and final one this morning, number eight. Jesus sends the Holy Spirit. I can't send the Holy Spirit. You can't send the Holy Spirit. You know who can send the Holy Spirit? God can send the Holy Spirit. And so when Jesus says this last part in verse 48, you are witnesses of these things. He's saying, you have seen what has happened. And then verse 49, it says, I am, notice what Jesus says, I am going to send to you. Not someone else. I am going to send the Holy Spirit to you. Last time I checked, I can't send the Holy Spirit anywhere. The Holy Spirit goes where the Holy Spirit wants. Why? Because he's God and I'm not. And so if Jesus can say that with power and authority, I am going to send, it is vindicating himself of saying all the things that I just got done teaching for the last three years, the life that I lived for 33 years, everything that was prophesied from the Old Testament, you are now seeing is true. And I am showing and proving over and over and over again that it is true. And if you still choose to deny it, then that is your choice, but don't sit here and say that I didn't show you. Don't say here that I didn't give you a chance. Don't say here that you didn't hear the word of God and the truth spoken to you today. You see, Jesus knows who's coming. He knows he's going to send the Holy Spirit. And only the power of God can be the one that sends him. And so we see Jesus being vindicated through these eight reasons. You see, last week we talked about how he was rejected. He was praised on one day entering Jerusalem, the last week of his life. But from the moment he enters Jerusalem, he got rejected and rejected and rejected again and again and again. Because he didn't do everything that the people wanted. What's amazing here, and this is where our heart has to come before God and say, God, I need you to transform my heart. Because we see two things here. When Jesus entered Jerusalem that final week, he got rejected because they, he didn't come and do the things that they wanted. But the 40 days that Jesus rose from the grave and spent the time, he got rejected because he did do what they wanted, and they still didn't want to accept him. See, I'm, I'm a firm believer that we all have to look in the mirror and look at our heart and say, where is my heart with God? Do I want to believe? Do I want to see the truth of what he has done? Or do I not? I've said this in years past, but I wholeheartedly believe this to be true. Because we've seen it in scripture to be true. Jesus could come down and appear before us right now and say hi to everyone. We see him and vanish. And there's people in here that would still not believe. Why? Because it's already happened. That's not some fantasy. It has happened already. And so when Jesus rose from the grave and he gave eight significant things that he did to say, look, it is truly me. The angels declared it. You have seen me. You have touched me. I have 
ate with you. I told you of all the Old Testament prophecies, and I even made some of my own. I taught you. I did all of these things for 40 days, 500 plus people. Are you still not going to believe? This was not a myth. This was not some fantasy. They were not hallucinating. They were not taking drugs. These were people who saw what Jesus did. They went from hiding in a room saying, what do we do now? To over the next 50 years, one by one, giving their life for him and willing to die. You know, it's amazing that we see when people lie, there's a lot of issues that come in with lying. One, when you lie so much, you forget what the truth is. Two, when you lie and you're threatened with death, it's been proven that the lie ends and the truth comes out. Because people don't die for a lie. I don't know about you, but I'm not going to die for a lie. I'm not going to do it. And so over the course of the next 50 years, these 12 men, and many others, by the way, died for what they knew was the truth. Not because of blind faith, because of faith of what Jesus showed them day after day after day. And they said, it's real on the earth. That's why we celebrate Easter today. It's because of what Jesus did. Not because of what we hope that he did. It's because of what he did. That he died and defeated the grave. He bore all the sins of the entire world before, during, and after. Even 2,000 years later for you and me. And he said, if you put your trust in me, you will have life for eternity. He showed himself vindicated so that you and I can be vindicated through his blood. Before God. And so the question really comes down today, to be honest with you, in my opinion, is not whether or not Jesus did what he did. I think when people actually read scripture and look at the historicity of everything claimed that he did, everything that was taught, everything that was done, the question really comes down to is, why have you not accepted him yet? Because the proof is overwhelming. It's not a blind faith. The proof is overwhelming. And Jesus, here's the great thing about it, Jesus made certain that it was. He didn't want to leave you out lingering. What if he made certain that the proof was overwhelming? And so this morning as we celebrate Easter, as we, get, as we remind uh, ourselves of what Christ has done, as we do an Easter egg hunt and have breakfast this morning and celebrate, and we're even going to have cake afterwards outside, by the way. I know, if you didn't have enough sweets already, <laughs> especially with your kids. As we celebrate, it is to be reminded of what we are celebrating. We are celebrating that the God of all eternity, the God of all creation, created everything, you and me included. That when we sinned and walked away, he did not walk away from us. That he gave his only son, his life, as a ransom for our sin because it had to be perfect and he's the only one that's perfect. That he lived a perfect life. That he died on a cross that he should not have had to, but he did anyways, freely. He was mocked, beaten, abused, and rejected by the world. And he chose to do it anyways so that you and I could have eternal life. And when he defeated the grave, he didn't go off and hide somewhere. He showed himself and made all these things crystal clear to make sure no one could look back and say, was it really him? It was clear it was him. So the question this morning is, will you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If you haven't already. That's what Easter is about. We're here to celebrate. If you've already accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, hallelujah. If you haven't, you are missing out because Jesus proved he was the Messiah. And you just want to stay in your ignorance. I'm sorry, that's the way it is. He proved over and over and over again. You can take this congregation and multiply it by three times, and he showed himself to that many people. 
today in court, if you have two or more witnesses, they take it, they take it as fact. He had 500. He proved it. And he proved that your life will change when you accept him as, Jesus, as Lord and Savior. That's why we celebrate this morning. Because that is the power of the cross. Let's pray. If you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior this morning, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I think it's the most powerful thing that you will ever do with your life. I promise you it is. It will change in how you live your life, your perspective on life, the love in your heart to know that you are redeemed, to know that you will spend eternity in heaven. All of these things come true when we say, Jesus, I need you as Lord and Savior. I repent from my sins. Repent just means we turn from living the world's way from sin and turn to him and say, Lord, I want to live your way. I want to know you for eternity, Jesus. Lord, come into my life. Wash away the sin that I may be righteous before God through your righteousness, Jesus. Lord, help me live the way you want me to live. Not the way I want to live in my own selfishness, but the way you want me to live. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for raising from the grave and proving once and for all you were the Messiah that we needed. Lord, I ask you to come into my heart. I ask you to come to my life, and I ask you to be the leader of my life. May I be in the passenger seat, not you. Father, if people have prayed that here this morning, I pray that they would go and tell someone, their husband, their wife, their, their friends, to me, someone, Lord, so that they can be better equipped, begin being discipled to know you better. But maybe there's many of us here that just need to have a prayer of just saying, God, I know you, but man, I just haven't been walking the way I been, should have been faithfully for these years. If that's you, God, I just pray. Lay down their heart of what it really means to, to walk with you. Not just to, to have said, Lord, I want you. But to walk with you daily. To ask for your guidance in our life. That you give us a joy in our life that we've never had before. Or that we need restored in our life. Jesus, only you can do that because you are God. You are the one that brings the light. You are the true light of the world. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus declared it. We believe it. And Father, we thank you for this morning for it. We love you in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, the ushers come forward this morning. We had um, a group of people at 5.30 this morning that came in and set up the PA system outside so we could do the sunrise service. And we did a service, and then we had a whole bunch of people tear that down, and you didn't even know it was there when you came here a little later today. I reflected back on the beginning of this church. The first four years, we were in a community center, and then three years, we were in a uh, uh, school. But we had to go through that routine every single Sunday, get there early, set up, do a service, break down, roll up all the cords. But I tell you what, um, we, back then we didn't have a lot of money, but... We were a giving church. From the very beginning, we tithed our offering. 10% of what was given to our church went out to ministries that we, we supported. And God kept showing up and showing up and showing up. There's no reason when we moved onto this property that we should have been able to purchase this building and this property. And yet God made that available to us. And six months before COVID hit, God dropped a dump load of money on top of us that got us through COVID. I'll talk... Now, you do the math in your own head. It was a Sunday morning that we gave away $45,000 to the ministries that we, we support. That was an amazing Sunday. I want to tell you that if you're cautious about your giving, God's got your back. He just wants you to be faithful in your giving, and God will provide for you. And why should we give? It's because God gave His only Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, I have everlasting life. God's a giver and shows who we are. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this morning, especially, Lord, for your son, Jesus Christ, and the promise that came to the world to walk among us, to show us your ways, Lord, 
and to present himself as a sacrifice to cover our sins so that we could come before your throne, Lord, to your glory. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that this congregation would be a, con a giving congregation, that they would learn to trust your faithfulness, Lord, and to give their finances over to you. I pray, Lord, this morning that you bless the gift and the giver. In Christ's name we pray. As we finish our offering, please stand and join us. You know, I recently saw something that said, there's the parts of your brain that are filled with worry and stress and anxiety and angst are not the same parts of your brain that can be filled with gratitude. So if you wake up every day and you fill yourself with gratitude, it's impossible to feel that stress. And that's what I think of when I think of this song. It's just the great gratitude that we have to have some loving God. Was rich, I remember who I was. I was lost, I was blind, I was running out of time. Sin separated, the bridge was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owe, broke my chains, freed my soul. For the first time I had hope Thank you, Jesus, for the